It was a hot summer day, 109 BC. Somewhere in the kingdom of Numidia, King Jugurtha and around 20,000 of his soldiers hid behind bushes on a hill. Though the heat made it challenging to keep the elephants and horses in check, their position was incredibly strategic. The river Mutul, across the empty plain, was the region's only water source. As they hid, the Roman army sent to Numidia to defeat Jugurtha trotted along into the plain. Jugurtha kept his men at bay. They waited until they were in an ideal position. Only then would they attack. This ambush, Jugurtha thought, would surely lead to victory. In the 2nd century BC, the Roman Republic expanded its border significantly. Some areas were bequeathed, Rome conquered others. One such war leading to conquest was the Numantine War in Hispania. One notable commander of Rome's auxiliary units was Jugurtha, the nephew of Numidian King Messipsa. Numidia, the North African Kingdom, had been a loyal Roman ally since the Punic Wars. Thanks to his service during the war, Jugurtha was no stranger to Roman military tactics. He became infamous among his enemies, but famous and respected among the Romans. Roman commander Scipio Aemilianus wrote to King Messipsa of his conduct. I am sure that you will be pleased to hear that in this war your nephew Jugurtha has distinguished himself above all others. I have high regard for what he has done for us, and I will do everything in my power to pass that esteem on to the Roman Senate and people. Speaking as your friend, I have to congratulate you personally for finding a man who is worthy of yourself and your father. In the years after the war, Messipsa adopted Jugurtha. In 118 BC, the king passed away. He bequeathed his kingdom to his two sons and the adopted Jugurtha. But Jugurtha wasn't planning on sharing the throne. Right after Messipsa passed away, he ordered the murder of his brothers. One of them was killed. The other, Adarbal, fled to Rome to request aid against his adoptive brother. When he appeared before the Senate, he reportedly said, It is not my fault, fathers of the Senate, that I have to turn to you yet again. No, I am forced to do this because of the violence of Jugurtha. He so desperately wants to destroy me that he pays no attention either to you or to the immortal gods. More than anything else, he thirsts for my blood. The Romans sent a delegation to Numidia to broker peace between the brothers in response. This appeared to be successful as Jugurtha accepted the kingdom being split in half. He bribed the Roman delegation, however. He awarded himself the wealthiest part and immediately prepared for the inevitable war he foresaw. Three years later, in 113 BC, after many unanswered propagations, Jugurtha simply invaded Adarbal's part of Numidia. Before too long, Adarbal was cornered in his capital, Serta. Together with Italian traders living there, he resisted Jugurtha's continued besiegement. As the besiegement was ongoing, Rome sent a second delegation to mediate peace. Once again, the delegation was bribed, although some sources indicate they simply lacked military strength and power. When Jugurtha subsequently took the city, he did not hold back. He tortured his brother to death and killed every adult male. In this act of brutality, Jugurtha overplayed his hand. Many Italian traders in the city had connections with Roman senators. Executing those Italians was one step too far for Rome, and upon learning of these events, they declared war. The first army, commanded by consul Lucius Calpurnius Bestia, did not see any battle, because upon their arrival, Jugurtha immediately surrendered. Bestia offered peace conditions that were so favorable, the Senate actually opened a formal investigation to see if Jugurtha once again bribed someone. Jugurtha was called to Rome to testify. Granted temporary immunity, he decided to have his nephew and rival living in Rome in exile assassinated. He did not hide his involvement and was subsequently chased out of the city. The peace never came to be. A new mission commanded by Postumius Albinus arrived in Numidia in 110 BC. Despite no detailed account surviving, Postumius likely got ambushed nearby the city of Sutul where Jugurtha kept his treasury. This defeat infuriated Rome even more. In 109, a new, sizable force under Quintus Cecilius Metellus arrived on Numidian shores. Metellus, known for being incorruptible, would be a different enemy altogether. With 
lightning speed, Metellus captured the cities as he trekked westward to seize Numidia's heartland. Jugurtha decided to use the terrain to his advantage and set up an ambush nearby the river Mutu. Jugurtha was known for putting a lot of thought and effort into selecting battle sites. Thanks to the Roman historian Gaius Salustius Crispus, a detailed description of the battleground survives. There was a river flowing from the south called the Mutul, and about 20 miles from it was a naturally desolate and uncultivated range of hills running parallel with the river. On this hill, which flanked the Romans' line of march, Jugurtha took his position with his line greatly extended. He commanded around 20,000 soldiers, of whom up to 5,000 cavalry and a few dozen elephants. His infantry and cavalry were lightly armored, more mobile than the Romans, and knew the region much better. The location was perfect for an ambush. Jugurtha hid most of his soldiers behind the bushes on the hill, so it was impossible to estimate the actual size of his force. In addition, the river Mutu formed a natural barrier if the Romans were to attempt and retreat. Although the plan was great in theory, Metellus spotted Jugurtha's ambush from a distance. However, that did not mean his legions avoided battle, as they were desperate to have their water resupplied. So in response to Jugurtha's anticipated ambush, Metellus rearranged his forces. Marius led the vanguard, while Metellus commanded the cavalry and main body following. Because the right flank faced the Numidians stationed on the hills, he strengthened it with three lines of reserves. Sallust reveals, Between the soldiers he placed the slingers and archers, while on the wings he stationed all the cavalry and after a brief address, which was all that there was time for, led the army down into the plain in its new formation, with what had been its front marching at the right angles to the direction of the enemy. To Metellus's surprise, Jugurtha did not attack immediately. The logical conclusion was that the king planned to launch several smaller attacks against the Romans to tire them out, a destructive tactic if successful. In response, Metellus ordered the cavalry unit to dash towards the river and set up camp there. If the battle became prolonged, at least the Romans would have access to water. Seeing the cavalry move onto the river, Jugurtha ordered his general Bomilcar to take 40 elephants, some infantry, and shadow them. As the small cavalry contingent set up camp, the entire Roman army continued their march into the plain. As soon as the rearguard was at a safe distance from the passage through which they came, Jugurtha ordered his army to execute their plan. 2,000 Numidian infantry soldiers rushed downhill on the side and swerved into the plain, blocking any escape route. Being the first to face combat, the infantry in the rearguard suffered significant casualties. The vast majority of Jugurtha's army now descended from the hill and crashed into the Roman right flank. Brutal close combat broke out and ferocious fighting took place among the entire line of Romans. In the rear, not just the right flank suffered rough fighting, as Metellus expected. The 2,000 Numidian soldiers enveloped the rear of the Romans entirely. As for the type of fighting, the Romans had trouble keeping up with the Numidian soldiers. Most of the attacks were perpetrated as hit-and-run tactics, and while the Roman lines weren't wide enough to have dedicated pila throwers, the Numidians remaining on the hill eagerly threw their spears and rocks at the Roman infantry. Whenever the infantry gained the upper hand, Numidian soldiers simply retreated, only to return with a vengeance once they recollected themselves. Up until this point, the cavalry had not seen combat yet, but that was soon to change. Metellus ordered part of his cavalry to charge against the Numidian cavalry. Instead of fighting them head-on, Jugurtha ordered his cavalry explicitly to disperse as soon as they faced a cavalry charge. They could quickly surround the Roman cavalry squadron thanks to their numerical superiority. And this is exactly what happened. When the Romans realized they weren't charging into anything, they stopped their charge. They were pelted with missiles as soon as they stopped and attacked by Numidian horsemen in their rear and flanks. The battle continued like this for hours. The Romans maintained their formation under challenging circumstances, being in a wide open plain and suffering continuous attacks and harassment by the Numidians. They would be done for if their formation broke, considering they were more or less surrounded. Throughout the fight, Metellus encouraged his men with this fact, the only alternative to victory, 
was certain death. Meanwhile, Bomilcar finally decided to launch his assault against the river squadron. Forty elephants and thousands of infantry charged towards the outnumbered Romans. The Romans responded to the charge by themselves charging at them head on. What happened next is nothing short of farcical. Though the entire plain was a desert, the elephants somehow tripped over some undergrowth. The elephants tripping was enough to cause the infantry to turn around and flee the battlefield. Sallust writes that the Romans killed most of the elephants and captured a few. The river squadron now turned around to ride towards the main Roman army, who were still embattled. A near disaster was averted when the main army thought the approaching horsemen were Numidians. Scouts informing the commanders the river squadron was returning were the only reason they did not end up getting a beating by their own men. Reinforced, Metellus ordered his infantry to push forward uphill to force Numidians to continue the close combat fight. This advance surprised the lightly armored Numidians so much that most of them simply scattered or were crushed by the advancing bulwark. By this time, it became clear the Romans had the upper hand, and most of the Numidian soldiers retreated or fought to the death. Jugurtha retreated from the battlefield together with Womilcar. There are no casualty numbers given, although it is safe to say the Romans suffered far less than the Numidians. Despite outnumbering the Romans nearly 2 to 1 and choosing the battlefield himself, Jugurtha suffered a painful defeat. The battle's outcome says a lot about the quality of the Roman legionaries present during the campaign. Or perhaps it said a lot about the lack of military experience of the Numidians. After all, Jugurtha levied most of his soldiers from local farms and towns. Though the Romans enjoyed a clear victory, they suffered enough casualties for Metellus to spend four days reorganizing his army before continuing the march into Numidia's heartland. Once they embarked on the march, they burned the fertile grounds and strongholds of Numidia. Metellus did not want the war to drag out much longer, nor did he fancy facing guerrilla warfare. However, this is precisely what happened. As the campaign of 109 BC ended, the war was by no means over. On an early morning in 106 BC, mists surrounded the Romans quartering nearby the Numidian city of Cirta. Their campaign season had ended, and they looked back on a fruitful, though perhaps a bit quiet, campaign. The Roman commander, Marius, wanted to get his soldiers to their winter quarters as soon as possible. He told a few scouts to ensure there weren't any significant dangers heading towards them. He was aware his adversary, Numidian king Jugurtha, concluded an alliance with the neighboring king of the Mauri, Bacchus. It doubled hostile forces in the region. Suddenly, he heard his scouts shouting as they ran towards the Roman camp. In the distance, Marius saw a sight that terrified him, and he hastily began shouting orders at his men. Jugurtha and Bacchus rode at the head of an army which dwarfed his. There was no time to prepare appropriately. As the first arrows hit the ground before him, he knew the battle would soon commence. The war against Numidian King Jugurtha had been waging on since 112 BC. Several armies sent by Rome tried and failed to defeat the Roe King. After finally earning a victory at Mutul River, Commander Metellus continued capturing towns and fortresses to prevent Jugurtha from having a solid strategic footing in his lands. He left behind small Roman units to maintain control wherever his main army wasn't. Jugurtha understood if he could not beat them in battle, he would have more success harassing and ambushing small Roman contingents. So Metellus split his army into two with Marius commanding one half. Both armies shadowed each other, preventing Jugurtha from ambushing any stray Roman units. In response, Jugurtha burned crops and poisoned water sources. Metellus did not feel for fighting a prolonged battle against an invisible enemy, and he laid siege to Zama to lure Jugurtha out. A group of Roman deserters warned the Roe king who was preparing the defense of Zama. Duly warned, he retreated into the hills with his cavalry. A minor skirmish between Jugurtha and Marius followed later that month. As the campaigning season ran to an end, there was no end in sight for the war. 
Metellus tried to use diplomacy to broker peace with Jugurtha, but to no avail. Meanwhile, Metellus's popularity in Rome ensured him to lead another year of campaigning in Africa. However, his own ranks weren't too enthusiastic about the commander. Despite many deserters at the lower level, the main danger was personified by his deputy, Gaius Marius. Marius was convinced he could do a better job and quickly wrap up the war. In winter, he requested Metellus to return to Rome to stand for consul. Metellus initially refused, but after multiple intrigues, he allowed Marius to depart to get rid of him. He wouldn't stand a chance to get elected anyway. He wasn't even of Roman noble origin, but he was Italian. As the campaigning season began in 108 BC, the Romans once again invaded Numidia. Though no comprehensive sources survive, it is clear Metellus' army besieged the fortress of Tala, capturing it together with most of Jugurtha's treasury. Besides this disaster, there are barely any details available of this campaign. As the season ended, things did not look good for Jugurtha. But when he was at his lowest point, did things turn around? He managed to attain an alliance with the Mauri and Gatulians to the west and south. These supplied ample soldiers. Especially King Bacchus of the Mauri felt Jugurtha was a less threatening neighbor than the Romans. The fact Jugurtha promised him a portion of his kingdom for his help probably influenced his decision. This alliance of two kings reinvaded Numidia and laid siege to the capital of Serta. But this new alliance was the least of Metellus's worries. As he came here by Serta, he received news of Rome. Marius was elected consul, but he was also elected commander against Jugurtha. To Metellus, this felt nothing short of betrayal. Unfortunately, sources do not reveal what happened next. But what is for sure is that the siege of Serta did not end in victory. When Marius returned to Rome in Africa and assumed command of the army, Metellus refused to meet with him to hand over command, counter, to Roman tradition. Marius brought over a sizable army from Italy, increasing the Roman number significantly. Perhaps ironically, Marius continued with a strategy which was very similar to that of Metellus. He laid sieges to cities, towns and forts, capturing Jugurtha's primary treasury house located near the Mauritanian border. Bacchus and Jugurtha separately roamed around Numidia, actively avoiding the Romans. As the population became alienated and Marius's army continued seizing strategic objectives, Jugurtha desperately required Bacchus's aid. The Mauri king avoided the Romans even more than Jugurtha though, mainly because he wasn't sure which outcome of the war would benefit him most. However, when Jugurtha offered him one third of his kingdom, he was sure. In response, Bacchus marched a large army of Maori cavalry into Numidia from the west. Jugurtha's main force was able to link up with them. Here is where ancient sources conflict a little. For example, Orosorius claims Marius was laying siege to Serta preceding this battle. However, Sallust agrees it is highly unlikely around this time of the war Serta was still in Jugurthan hands mainly because he had been evading the Romans for most of the campaigns and the Romans made it their goal to capture as many cities and strongholds as possible. At any rate, both accounts agree on the location of the battle, close by Serta. As Marius and his Roman army quartered close by Serta, he deployed scouts to keep an eye on potential ambushes by Jugurtha. He wanted to get to his winter quarters as soon as possible. Unfortunately, there are no numbers available for the size of the Roman army, although it likely numbered between 30 and 40,000 men, both cavalry and infantry. As soon as a few of his scouts informed the commander a Jugurthine army indeed was closing in on them, screams arose from the distance. The enemy was closer than anticipated. Before the Roman commanders could order their troops in formation, the combined Mauri and Gutulian cavalry charged at the Romans. This army outnumbered the Romans at least 2 to 1. Instead of a frontal charge, many horsemen maintained their distance from the Roman camp, pelting the legionaries with javelins. The Romans, in turn, quickly took to arms and rushed to take their formations. The Roman cavalry mounted their horses to launch a counter charge. 
Meanwhile, some Maori cavalry charged into the Romans, although they harnessed the typical lack of strategy the Romans became accustomed to from their enemies. But even though the Romans were a disciplined army, a real formation to counter the ambush had not yet been taken, Sellers describes. The combat was more like that of an attack of brigands than a battle. Without standards and in disorder, horse and foot mass together, some gave ground, others slew their opponents. Many who were bravely fighting against the enemy were surrounded from the rear. Valor and arms were not sufficient protection against a foe, who was superior in numbers and attacked every side. At last, the Romans, both the raw recruits and the veterans, who as such were skilled in warfare if the nature of the ground brought any of them together, formed a circle, thus protecting themselves on every side and presenting an orderly front to the attacks of the enemy. The soldiers who did not see direct combat rushed to parts of the line which required reinforcement. The battleground was scattered, as was customary whenever the Romans engaged the Gurfa's army. Some soldiers threw rocks at the Romans, others pelted them with javelins, and yet others charged at them. Marius and his bodyguard moved behind Roman legionaries fighting, shouting encouraging words and motivating the men to fight. When his shouts were drained out, instead Marius simply joined the fight to lead by example. The fighting went on for several hours like this. By the time the day ended, the Romans were unpleasantly surprised by Jugurtha's army not slowing down their attack one bit. Likely, this was caused by Jugurtha convincing his soldiers that darkness would be advantageous to them. Understanding their adversaries were willing to continue the fight throughout the night, Marius rapidly adapted his battle plan. There were two hills close by the battleground. Marius ordered his deputy Lucius Cornelius Sulla and the cavalry to seize the hill with a spring on top. Then, together with his infantry, he made an effort to reach the other hill. The bulwark of Romans pushed through their adversaries, climbing the hill while fending off attacks. Not being able to seize the hills, Jugurtha's army understood their unfavorable position and the immense costs of attacking the Romans. Finally, the night turned quiet as Jugurtha's army set up camp on the elevated ground in front of the two Roman hills. Scattered tents and fires illuminated the place. Jugurtha's army could not defeat the Romans, but meanwhile, the Romans were trapped on the hills, unable to break out. Marius ordered his men to keep completely quiet throughout the night. Usually, night watchers used audible signals to communicate, but even they were forbidden from making noise. Then, around a fire, Marius and his commanders planned the counterattack to launch at sunrise. Throughout the night, Jugurtha's soldiers kept a close look at the encamped Romans. Finally, at dawn, as the sun rose, they noticed movement. Exhausted from a long day of fighting and a night of being on high alert, the Numidians were anything but information. But the Romans were. The Roman hornblowers gave a signal to launch an all-out attack. The cavalry and legions shouted their battle cry and burst down the hill. The Maori and Gatulians were scattered in their encampments, not expected a sudden coordinated rush. According to Sallust, the Maori and Gatulians, suddenly being awakened by this strange and terrible sound, were incapable of feeling or of arming themselves, or indeed taking any action at all. Their enemy was upon them, and no help was at hand. The shouting and din, the confusion and terror, had made them frantic with fear. In the end, they were completely routed. Most of their standards and arms were taken, and more were killed than in any previous battle for they were too tired and too much dazed by the sunrise to make good their escape. The result of the battle was inconclusive. Although Sallust implies Marius obliterated a large part of Jugurtha's army, what happened next contests this claim. Only a few days later, an even larger army ambushed the Romans, resulting in the decisive Second Battle of Serta. The end of the war was coming closer, and both Marius and Jugurtha felt it. There would be just one more final, decisive battle. The Jugurthine War had been waging on for six years. Roe King Jugurtha engaged in a prolonged guerrilla-like war against Rome. Multiple commanders had failed to defeat the king, and it wasn't until the incorruptible Metellus took over command that the Romans achieved several victories. However, 
Scheming and plotting by his deputy Gaius Marius led to his removal of command and the young ambitious Marius to take over. As the campaign of 106 BC was running to its end, Marius' command suffered its baptism of fire. At the first battle of Serta, his army was ambushed by a force of 60,000 Mauri and Gatulian cavalry. Sources conflict on what happened next, although the Romans certainly defeated Jugurtha. As they emerged victoriously, Marius ordered his army to continue the march to their winter quarters instead of following up the victory and defeating the king once and for all. But the events following Marius's victory at the First Battle of Serta contest the account that Jugurtha suffered a significant defeat. Marius took great precautions not to suffer an ambush again. The entire trek to his winter quarters, his army, would march in battle formations. His deputy, Sulla, commanded the rear in a square formation, while he commanded a vanguard. Marius tossed his scouts to keep an eye on Jugurtha's army and watch out for possible ambushes. On the fourth day of marching, Marius received worrying reports from these scouts. Hostile troops were approaching the Romans from every direction. Moreover, Jugurtha's army size and composition differed wildly from whichever story Marius decided to believe. Confused and unsure of what to expect, he ordered his legionaries to maintain their battle formation and to prepare for the worst. This turned out to be the right call. Before too long, his legionaries trembled at the screams of tens of thousands Mauri and Gatulian horsemen and soldiers. Their battle cries marked the beginning of an attack by Jugurtha's largest army thus far. The first thing the Romans realized was the positioning of the enemy. They were surrounded. Four columns charged towards them from every side. According to Sallust, Jugurtha commanded approximately 90,000 troops, his largest force thus far. We don't have an exact figure for the Roman army, but it is safe to assume they were outnumbered. Subsequently, the Mauri charged into the flanks commanded by Sulla and Marius, whereas the Gatulians charged into the main Roman body. But not all columns attacked at the same time. Sulla was the first to engage in battle against the charging Mauri cavalry. He ordered his infantry to defend the baggage train, while his cavalry resisted the horsemen as best as they could. Besides ferocious close combat between the horsemen and the legionaries, the Romans also suffered hills of javelins thrown by the horsemen, unable to reach Sulla's line. But although some horsemen could not reach Sulla's line, Bacchus' son Volux commanded the Mauri infantry. More mobile, these charged straight into any open area they could find. The Roman vanguard had suffered a similar charge as this was going on, except by a larger force, personally commanded by Jugurtha. This mixed infantry cavalry force engaged in the fiercest battle yet, as Marius's vanguard tried their best to hold their positions and the Jugurthine army gave it their all to break through, the rearguard saw a more apparent division of power. Sulla's men made serious inroads against the Mauri. The final breaking point was Sulla's cavalry. As they inflicted heavy damage against the Mauri lines, the panic spread among these horsemen. Before too long, most of them were routed and they began fleeing. Sulla decided to give chase with his cavalry. As a result, he left the flank of the Roman center entirely exposed. Bacchus, who arrived later to the battle, used this by flanking the Roman lines and enveloping them. When word reached Jugurtha that Bacchus finally arrived, giving battle at the Roman rear, he left the vanguard to ride towards him between friendly lines. Although sources don't specify anything regarding the fourth attacking column, it is assumed that combat emerged on every flank of the Romans by this time. They were hard-pressed due to the simultaneous assaults and numerical superiority of Jugurtha's army. When Bacchus and Jugurtha saw each other, Jugurtha cried out in fluent Latin that the Romans were fighting in vain since he had personally killed Marius shortly before. Jugurtha displayed a bloodied sword to emphasize his point. Some turmoil spread among the legionaries, unsure of what to make of Jugurtha's claims. But before doubt could take over, salvation arrived for the Romans. It arrived in the form of Sulla's returning cavalry. They abandoned their chase 
of the fleeing Maori and instead crashed into Bacchus' flank. The charge was so brutal that Bacchus did not even bother to resist it. Instead, with many casualties upon impact, he decided to flee the battle together with whatever remained of his cavalry. Bacchus, abandoning the battlefield, left Jugurtha isolated. The Numidian king tried to rouse his men to fight with a speech and through leading by example, but the lack of discipline among his soldiers and the structured, drilled and battle-hardened Romans began gaining the upper hand everywhere. Moreover, his levied soldiers, mostly from rural areas, were no match for the Roman veterans. As they tried to keep up the fight, Sulla's cavalry managed to surround Jugurtha. Together with his loyal subordinates, Jugurtha resisted ferociously. Brief savage combat broke out, but they were no match for Sulla's cavalry. Sallus reveals that, but through all, on Jugurtha's side and left were slain, he broke through alone, escaping amid a shower of weapons. As this was going on, Marius emerged victoriously from the vanguard. Scattering their opponents, Marius and his bodyguard swerved around to flank the Maori and Gatulians fighting on the flanks and rear. With the situation entirely reversed, suddenly Jugurtha's army found itself fighting on every flank and being attacked in the rear. Before too long, most soldiers realized they were on the back foot and fled in a panic. Upon seeing their king escape, the last warriors resisting the Roman bulwark broke rank and fled. Salust described the chase. There was, there was a, fearful a fearful sight, sight in the open, open plains of pursuit, pursuit slaughter, slaughter or capture. Horses, Horses and men were thrown, thrown to the ground, ground many, many of them wounded, without, without the strength, the strength to, escape to escape or the will to remain, to remain still, still struggled, struggled to get up, only, only to collapse to immediately. immediately. As, far as far as the eye could see, see the battlefield was strewn with weapons, armor and corpses, with patches of bloody dirt showing between them. Despite the exact number of casualties unknown, it is safe to assume Jugurtha's army was dealt a very decisive blow. Marius's objective shifted in the aftermath of the Second Battle of Serta. Although Jugurtha once again escaped, the focus did not remain on capturing or killing the Numidian king in battle. Instead, he sent a diplomatic envoy to Bacchus. The Mauritanian king lost a large part of his army during the previous battles. Moreover, he understood the implications of his gamble against Rome. There was no way he would be able to avoid Rome's vengeance. Within a week of losing the battle, he sent a diplomatic envoy to Marius to open negotiations. After some back and forth, Bacchus received a very clear offer. Deliver Jugurtha, and Rome would forgive his participation in the war. Marius's deputy Sala traveled to Bacchus's court to negotiate the deal. But... According to Sallust, Bacchus schemed with Jugurtha in the background to abduct Sulla and to hold him as ransom to sue for peace. Although it is doubtful if this would have worked, after all, at the time Sulla was only a deputy commander of lower nobility, it is speculation to think otherwise. All that is known is that Bacchus invited both Sulla and Jugurtha to his court. He kept both parties in the dark of his actual loyalty until the final moment. But Bacchus understood Rome's might, so when the opportunity presented itself, he had Jugurtha's bodyguard assassinated and the king arrested. He handed him over to Sulla, who together with Marius brought him to Rome. According to Orosaurus, Marius's triumph on January 1st, 104 BC saw Jugurtha and his two sons paraded on the streets. Plutarch reveals how the king met his end. We are told that when Jugurtha had been led in triumph, he lost his reason, and that when, after the triumph, he was cast into prison, where some tore the tunic from his body and others were so eager to snatch away his golden earring that they tore off the lobe of his ear, and when he had been thrust down naked into the dungeon pit, in utter bewilderment, and with a grin on his lips, he said, Hercules, how cold his Roman bath is. But the wretch, after struggling with hunger for six days and up to the last moment, clinging to the desire for life, paid the penalty which his crimes deserved. We don't know why Jugurtha ended up meeting with Bacchus at his court. Sallust and Orsurius implicitly ascribe it to naivety, although a man of Jugurtha's cunning must have known Bacchus had no other option but to betray him. We will never know for sure. 
all that is known is that the man who challenged Rome's might for years with decent success eventually met his end in a Roman dungeon. Bacchus ended up receiving his reward. He was named ally of the Roman people, retained his Mauritanian crown and gained a third of Western Numidia. Jugurtha's half-brother Gauda was confirmed as a new king and the Gatulians became an independent entity from Numidia. Ironically, Bacchus was the tangible victor of the war. Having gambled on the wrong side initially, his kingdom was small when the war broke out. Yet by the time it ended, its territory and might increased significantly. Not to mention the power being Rome's ally brought with it. It wasn't until Rome's two civil wars half a century later that Numidia was partitioned, with the western part retaining its independence. In contrast, the eastern part was added to the Roman province of Africa. Another century later, in 40 AD, Caligula annexed the kingdom and divided it into two new provinces. It certainly is a fascinating history, but those tales are for another time. Thank you very much for watching this video. If there's a topic, battle or event you would like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also really like to thank all my patrons and channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and want to support my work, consider joining me on Patreon. For just $1 a month, you already gain access to exclusive content. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.